subcommittee will come to order. Uh, we have uh, today's hearing on the administration's refusal to execute Section 618 of uh, Public Law 101-136, which restricts the scope of uh, federal employee non-disclosure agreements. I'm uh, pleased that uh, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Gerald Kletzer, could join us in the hearing. Uh, we ask unanimous consent to put in the uh, statement of uh, the gentlelady from California, Barbara Boxer, and uh, also of Mr. Frank Horton. Uh, this is a uh, particularly serious matter that requires that the committee uh, meet today. I apologize to the witness for uh, him, uh, Mr. Garfinkel, having to come before us on such short notice, I, s I thank him for his cooperation. We're confronted with a challenge to the constitutional process which should not permit of delay. Uh, there has been disagreement between the Congress and the executive branch for at least six years over the issue of so-called non-disclosure or secrecy agreements uh, required of federal employees. Last week, for the first time, it was brought to the attention of the Congress in response to today's witness to questions I had posed to him in writing that the executive branch had indeed decided to defy the restrictions enacted by Congress and signed by the President himself. To my knowledge, this is the first time that this has happened since the Reagan administration was informed by a United States Court of Appeals that its decision to suspend the Competition in Contracting Act was, and I quote, utterly at odds with the texture and plain language of the Constitution and with nearly two centuries of judicial precedent. The court in that case went so far as to hold that the President's position to uh, refuse to enforce a duly enacted law signed by him constituted bad faith. Uh, <clears throat> let's review, before our witness comes forward, uh, the history of the dispute over non-disclosure agreements. In 1983, when President Reagan announced that he was, quote, up to his keister, unquote, in leaks and promulgated National Security Decision Directive 84, which massively expanded the de executive branch's use of non-disclosure agreements. Uh, it generated uh, opposition, substantial opposition in Congress, which included a moratorium on such agreements that were put in the 1984 appropriations law. And as a result, the president suspended portions of uh, National Security Directive 84 and promised to work with Congress on resolving the matter. It should be observed that Congress has not objected to uh, all use of non-disclosure agreements. No one argues that against the need to prevent leaks of classified information. The criticisms have been that the agreements impose additional requirements which violate the First Amendment by restricting disclosure of non-classified material and by imposing censorship through a pre-publication review system. In addition, we have objected to the agreements uh, that interfere with communications to Congress, especially by uh, potential whistleblowers or others uh, that are concerned with uh, efficiency and uh, uh, fighting fraud in the government. The issue uh, came uh, forward again in 1986 uh, when the in Information Security Oversight Office headed by Mr. Garfinkel uh, issued new forms which included a concept of classifiable information as distinct from classified information. Under the government-wide program, some two and a half million government employees and a million more defense contractor employees were being required to sign non-disclosure forms, nearly a half a million with explicit censorship requirements. Congress responded with a new partial moratorium as part of the continuing resolution 
for fiscal year 1988. That moratorium precluded, among other provisions, the use of the concept of classifiable material. And as a result of litigation, the executive branch removed the term classifiable and issued new forms numbered SF3112. The new forms, however, retain some of the objectionable features of the old ones, and Congress passed another moratorium as part of the appropriations bill passed uh, two months ago in October, banning the use of Form 312 and narrowing the permissible scope of any new forms. Now, on each of these three prior occasions, the executive branch responded to the congressional action by modifying its policy toward these non-disclosure agreements in a manner which it believes secured compliance with the statute. Now, uh, without explanation, it has chosen to flaunt the law, assert a presidential power to ignore duly enacted statutes. This is precisely what the court in Lear Siegler said it could not do. Now, on signing the Treasury and Post Office Appropriations Bill on November 3rd of last month, President Bush noted his objections to Section 618 which contained the restrictions on non-disclosure agreements and instructed executive officials to implement that section in what he termed a manner consistent with the Constitution. And so, uh, a few weeks later, I directed uh, Director Garfinkel, I uh, directed to him a series of questions in writing concerning the implementation of Section 618 of the Appropriations Bill. He responded last week to those inquiries and included a notice he had distributed to all executive agencies on November 9th, instructing them to ignore the provisions of 618 to continue to implement and enforce uh, SF-312 despite the legal prohibition. And uh, I will at this point insert uh, into the record copies of my letter to Director Garfinkel and his response. While this hearing uh, is concerned with the use of Form 312 itself, we're of course more concerned about the constitutional authority of the executive branch uh, or one of its agencies to deliberately flout a law passed by Congress and signed by the President uh, himself. And so we uh, welcome Stephen Garfinkel. Uh, uh, to our witness table. He's been uh, director of the Information of Security Oversight, uh, Information Security Oversight Office since 1980. I, th I thank you for joining us, and I ask the gentleman for Wisconsin, from Wisconsin if he has a statement he would like to make. No statement. Would you please stand, raise your right hand, and solemnly swear the testimony you're going to give is the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, we've got your statement. We'll uh, introduce it into the record, Mr. Garfinkel, <coughs> and we'd like to hear from you at this point, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Kleska. Uh, with your permission, Turn I would... Turn on your mic. Okay. With your permission, I would like to read from my prepared statement because I think it does respond to some of the issues you've raised in your opening remarks. Under Executive Order 12356, entitled National Security Information, the Director of the Information Security Oversight Office, or ISU, is responsible to the President for overseeing the government-wide system under which information is classified, declassified, and safeguarded. ISU was first created in 1978, and I was appointed its second director in May 1980. In March 1983, the President directed that ISU issue and implement an executive branch-wide non-disclosure agreement to be executed by cleared individuals as a condition of access to classified information. In September 1983, ISU issued the Classified Information Non-Disclosure Agreement, Standard Form 189. Five years later, on September 29, 1988, 
ISOO issued the Standard Form 312 to replace the Standard Form 189. ISOO estimates that, as of this date, more than 3 million cleared individuals have executed either the SF-189 or the SF-312. In developing the SF-312, which is the subject of today's hearing, ISU took into account and often incorporated the views of interested individuals and organizations, including members of Congress. For example, more than three months before it issued the SF-312, ISU transmitted a draft of the proposed nondisclosure agreement to the chairman and ranking minority member of eight committees of Congress, including the House Committee on Government Operations. ISU's letters in closing the draft nondisclosure agreement specifically sought the views and comments of those committees and offered to brief the members or staff at their convenience. ISU was largely able to accommodate the views of those committees and members who commented on the proposed agreement. We issued the SF-312 reasonably assuming that almost all the controversial issues that had arisen over the SF-189 had been resolved. Section 618 of the Treasury, Postal Service and Government, General Government Appropriations Act for fiscal year 1990 imposes certain restrictions on the implementation and enforcement of nondisclosure agreements required of government employees who are cleared for access to classified information. Except that it specifically references the SF-312 and CIA Form 4355 instead of their predecessor forms, SF-189 and CIA Form 4193, Section 618 is identical to provisions that appeared in the Treasury, Postal Service, and Government, General Government Appropriations Act for fiscal year 1989 and the continuing resolution for fiscal year 1988. The proper construction and constitutionality of the latter provision is currently the subject of litigation between several members of Congress and the Director of ISU, among other parties. In signing the current Treasury Appropriations Bill into law, the President issued a signing statement which strongly objected to any construction of Section 618 that would impede his constitutional responsibility to protect classified information. Among other things, the President directed, and I quote, that executive branch officials implement the provisions of Section 618 in a manner consistent with the Constitution." End quote. ISU has previously provided the subcommittee with a copy of the President's signing statement. Consistent with the President's signing statement, I sought the advice of the Department of Justice on what actions ISU should take in light of Section 618. I receive from the Department of Justice its view that the proper interpretation of Section 618 requires reading it to permit the continued implementation and enforcement of the SF-312. Apart from its view that this is the proper construction of the statute, the Department of Justice advised me that this interpretation is strongly supported by the Supreme Court's admonition in pending litigation concerning Section 618's predecessor statute. The High Court stated that, if possible, this provision should be construed in a manner that will avoid constitutional difficulties. Accordingly, on November 9, 1989, I advised all agencies that create or handle classified information to continue to implement and enforce the SF-312. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Congressman Kleckska, if I could, I would like to supplement this statement because of something that happened last night. Last night, I learned for the first time that the 
pending litigation, at least in one of the three cases that is pending, has been amended, and now that litigation specifically references Section 618 instead of the predecessor statute with the old uh, appropriations bill. And uh, that, of course, has some bearing on. Well, what, what's the implication of that as far as you're concerned? Sir? Well, I think that emphasizes the fact that that we continue to be uh, involved in litigation over this very matter and that this matter is before the courts. The, uh, the points that continue apparently to separate us from, from some who, who continue to have problems with the program are still before the courts and uh, now specifically uh, the issue of Section 618 has been raised. And it, it's my understanding that in plaintiff's motion, uh, they have actually moved for a preliminary injunction uh, to force us to cease the implementation of the SF-312, and so that issue is now being litigated, and, and we will get a decision of the federal courts on that very point. Again, I did not learn of this until last night, and, and actually I have not been formally served with those papers as a party defendant. So you think that uh, that, that filing now uh, takes the uh, president off the hook in terms of enforcing the law he signed? Well, as I mentioned in my testimony, Mr. Chairman, the president believes that we are, and, and the administration believes, that we are implementing Section 618, that we are not disobeying the statute, that we have sought to interpret it in the only means possible that would permit the President to protect classified information, which is his responsibility under Article II of the Constitution. Well, aren't we talking about the term classifiable information and not classified information? I don't, I don't Didn't think... Didn't I make that clear in the beginning? I We're not think... arguing about the right of the executive branch to deal with restricting classified information, we're talking about that term someone invented called classifiable information. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the word classifiable information has been removed. Unmarked information. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I think it's important to recognize that when we talk about the security classification system, we are talking about information. We are talking about the sensitivity of information. We're not always necessarily talking about the sensitivity of documents that might have classification markings on them. You mean there's I, this gray world out there of, I mean, we have the right to classify everything from top secret down to whatever, and now there's another area? No, no, sir. We're not talking. You know, if something is, is, is secret, or should not be made public, we can, you, you have every right to uh, classify it as such. But if it isn't, why impose on the entire, uh, most of the, the federal government this responsibility about this new, this new category? There is no new category, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this non-disclosure agreement applies only to classified information with the very small uh, universe of information that is currently in the process of undergoing a classification determination. But essentially we're talking about classified information. Classified information sometimes comes through oral communications between individuals. I've gone to any number of briefings in which I've been advised at the time of the briefing that the information I'm being provided is classified. Nobody's arguing about that. I quite agree with you. Well, that is the information that, that is unmarked. We cannot mark oral communications unless we reduce them to writing and apply classification markings. Well, <clears throat> when you instructed uh, agencies to ignore the provisions of Section 618, 
Did you uh, send a memorandum of that to the Congress to notify us about that action? Well, first of all, I did not. It, my letter does not tell them to ignore Section 618. It, it does tell them to continue to implement the standard form 312. We obviously have a difference of opinion on how we are implementing Section 618. I'm, I am operating under instructions and advice that I've received that the only constitutional way that, the, that Section 618 can be construed is in a way that would permit the continued implementation of this non-disclosure agreement. Oh, relax. Okay, Section 618, no funds appropriated in this or any other act may be used to implement or enforce the agreements in standard form 312 or any other non-disclosure policy form if such policy form or agreement, one, concerns information other than specifically marked as classified. Specifically, other than classified, right? That that is part of what Section 618 says. It goes on to reference unmarked information as well, and unmarked information, which is not classified. No, the the unmarked information is classified information. We are not talking in this agreement about information that is unclassified. As I mentioned earlier, there's a very minor uh, universe of, of information that right now is in the process of, of, of an authorized original classifier making a classification decision, but that is a, an extremely narrow range of information. Unmarked information is not a narrow range of information because any oral communication of classified information, which takes place, I would suggest, thousands of times daily, would fall within uh, the concept of unmarked classified information. Now, when you uh, sent this memorandum that did not repeal 618, uh, you were, was this done at your own initiation? Well, I'm the re official responsible for implementing the non-disclosure agreement. I'm the official responsible for this particular program. I did not do it without consulting uh, those other persons within the administration who have expertise on this issue, as, especially those individuals who have uh, legal expertise on these matters. Right. And may I ask you who those parties were? Well, I consulted with uh, individuals within the Executive Office of the President. I consulted with individuals in a couple of components of the Department of Justice. And I also discussed the matter with officials at the Central Intelligence Agency since CIA uh, ha had been a co-defendant in the litigation surrounding this matter. Now, will you be kind enough to tell me their names and titles? Well, I don't think it would be appropriate to give you their specific names. I, I can tell you that they are representatives of these agencies um, who were duly authorized to, to speak for those agencies and the actions they're taken. Well, I'm perfectly willing to take your word for it. Uh, but is there some reason why their names cannot be put on the public record? Well, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, that... You mean I don't need may... to know who told you? Well, I think it would be inappropriate at, at this particular occasion. I uh, perhaps... Uh, would you tell me off the record? 
Well, I, I will you ever to... tell me? Is there any way I can ever find this out? I would assume that you would be able to find it out, sir. But by this... by what process? You're under oath, and you're before a government committee. Uh, is there some other way I can find it out other than asking you? Or maybe you want me to ask everybody in the executive branch if they told you or talked well, with you. Well, Mr. Chairman, I have told you what agencies were involved in this. Well, that's and, very kind and, of you. And I am here representing representing the Information Security yeah. Oversight Office. I, I think it would be more... You don't think the American people are entitled to the procedure of understanding how you arrived at this decision, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent? Or do you think mm. that the way you came to this decision is classifiable information that we don't need to know about? Is this secret? No, sir, it is not. Well, then tell us. Mr. Chairman, I think it's fair to say that there are there is information other than classified information uh, that demands some degree of confidentiality. Well, that's precisely that why we're here, Mr. Garfinkel. Mm -hmm. We're saying if something is classifiable, it ought to be classified. The you, you've invented all of the, the, the uh, several distinctions of what, sh what kind of classification information is. Now you're coming before me telling me that that only not only happened when we passed a law trying to prevent it, now you're telling me that this now exists in terms of how you came to the decision to disobey the congressional law. Mr. That Chairman, that's a secret. No, I have not said that this is a classified secret and it is not a classified matter. I have suggested that the names, so you've asked for the specific names of yes. those individuals who partook in this particular decision. Uh, quite honestly, I do not know all the names because a lot of the deliberation took place at those agencies after I referred the matter to them. I will be happy to go back to those agencies and address to them your request that they provide the names of those individuals and allow them the opportunity to provide them to you if that is their decision. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman yield. I yield to the gentleman from Wisconsin. Uh, Mr. Garfinkel, what agencies did you personally contact on this matter? As I mentioned, I talked to individuals within several offices of the Which, Executive Office of the President, those? the National Security Council, the White House Counsel's Office, the Office of Management and Budget. I also talked to individuals CIA. at the CIA. Individuals so then you personally approach people from these at least four agencies on this particular matter. You called somebody uh, from um, uh, the White House Counsel, right? I did not. I had. I did talk to someone from the White House Counsel's <clears throat> Who office. Who did you talk to? Uh, again, I will defer to well, that office. See, I don't to see why that's the classified. These are government it's employees. It's not classified. Well, then. It is not a classified, but it is part of the deliberative process within the executive That's fine, branch. But so why can't you divulge the name? Is, am I missing I'm, something here? I'm not suggesting, I don't know for, sir, for certain, Mr. Kleska, that we cannot, but that is not my decision. I do not speak for those agencies. I'm, we're not asking you to speak for them. We're just asking you who was your direct contact in the various agencies you've, uh, you've mentioned. I, I, again, I would be happy to take your request to those agencies and well, ask them to provide you those well, specific Unless names. I'm totally off base here, I don't see what is so highly secretive about who you talk to on this matter. Well, I, I'm I don't, missing something. Are you playing you a know, game here? Or no, I'm not. I certainly don't. Is this cops and robbers? No, sir, it's not. Well, who'd you talk to at the CIA? You had a place to call and talk to some individual. Who was that individual? I talked to individuals within the general counsel's office of the CIA and within the Office of Legislative Affairs. Of the okay, who did you contact at Legislative Affairs? Again, sir, I would, I, I, I would prefer that... Why is that not public knowledge? I'm, I'm missing something here. I don't know that it is not public knowledge, sir. Well, I, tell I also don't know that, that it is public knowledge. When, uh, Good so. luck, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> did the President of the United States tell you to, uh, to violate this law? Mr. Chairman, we take the position that we are not violating well, did this the, law. Did the President of the United States instruct you 
on the conduct that you were to take? In the signing statement that you and I both quoted from, the President instructed executive branch officials, of which I am one, to implement Section 618 in a constitutional manner. I followed up on that instruction by consulting with those officials within the executive branch who are responsible provi for providing me that advice. Under the executive order on national security information, I am instructed to consult with the Department of Justice when there is a legal issue that arises under Executive Order 12356. I did so, and uh, that advice suggested that there was one constitutional way of looking at Section 618, and that way would permit the continued implementation of the SF-312. Did the President of the United States tell you how to uh, conduct yourself in terms of what you did with reference to Section 618? The President of the United States instructed me to implement Section 618 in a constitutional manner. The President of the United States further instructed me to consult with the Department of Justice for legal, legal opinions on issues such as this uh, so in following the President's directions on, under those two documents, uh, that is what I did. Did he say that to you directly? He did not say that to me directly. I read it in the President's signing statement. Did the President talk to you directly about this matter? No, sir. Did the Attorney General of the United States talk to you directly about this matter? No, sir. Uh, by what authority do you refuse to tell this committee with whom you've discussed in the executive branch of government about this matter? Mr. Chairman, I do believe that it's very important when we approach problems like this that we be given the leeway just as we would grant that you have the leeway to deliberate about what appropriate responses are. Uh, this is a very sensitive issue because, from our perspective, we have sought to be cooperative with the committees of Congress on this matter. And we don't, we don't take lightly our responsibility to consult with you and to work this thing out if possibly we can. We've been, we've been having discussions on this particular issue with members and staff of Congress now for probably well, since 1983, when it first began. I've attended any number of hearings on this issue. So we don't take that lightly, and we don't take lightly the need that we be able to deliberate with the idea that we can get the candid expression of the individuals who participate. I don't know, I don't personally know, that if I come up here and tell you that A, B, C, and D were the people who deliberated, that the next time we have an occasion to arrive at a similar decision, that A, B, C, and D will all show up. They may choose to, to remove themselves from the provision of candid, uh, candid uh, advice on this matter. Well, then I assume from your answer that uh, you do not have any legal authority to withhold this information. Not a not about the subject matter, but about with whom you consulted in arriving at your position. I, I have advised you with what offices and agencies I consulted, and I would encourage either you directly or through me, I'd be happy to go back to those offices and agencies and tell them that you have requested the names of the specific individuals who participated in this decision and give them the opportunity to make the decision for, the, for themselves. I, I should not be the one to make that decision for the Executive Office of the President. I should not be the one to make that decision for the Central Intelligence Agency. Well, have you talked uh, to the Director of the CIA about this matter? Since receiving uh, the, Ever. Your, your letter? Ever. I can't, I can't say for sure that I have never 
talked to the director of the CIA about this non-disclosure agreement problem. If I have, it was very much in passing. Well, and that's three but people but I, in the federal I have not government that we don't have to worry about. Now we have uh, several thousand others. Uh, you're, you're offering now to go back and find out if it's okay to mention their names and you'll get back to us. Have you testified before at a congressional hearing? Yes, sir. Which one? Or ones? Can't say. Here, uh, over, the, <laughs> over the course of, of almost 19 years, uh, I've testified probably at it could be as many as 50 hearings. 50? Uh, it could be as many as that. I, All right. I, I, Have you ever refused to tell anybody with whom you were consulting about a subject that you came before a committee on? I've never had the question that has been posed to me here addressed to me in a prior hearing that I recall. So I've, I've never had occasion to, uh, to say that I would, that I can't tell you the names. I, and I'm telling you today, it's not that I, I don't feel that I should be the one to provide the names of those persons who participated in the deliberative process. I believe that should be a decision to be made by those, those agencies, those officials of those agencies. Well, I, I may want to call them forward, but I don't know who they are. Well, I, I would strongly suggest that knowing what offices and agencies are involved, they, they will be able to track down these people. Now, are, are you assuming that the agencies and the people in them didn't want you to let us know who they were, or are you merely being cautious and not cooperating with this subcommittee until you find out if they want you to know, us to know about it? I think uh, it's a little bit of both. I, I will say that the um, issue of the names of the persons who participated in these deliberations was raised at one of the meetings that I attended and the unanimous advice I received is that it would be inappropriate for me as the director of ISU to re uh, release those names at this hearing, but rather to uh, invite the committee, the subcommittee, to uh, approach this particular issue through those agencies. And what form, what classification of uh, secrecy is this that, that we're operating under at this hearing? <laughs> the information is not classified. Well, I know it isn't. That's why I thought I could ask you the questions. Well. But, so it must be something else. There are other categories of information. Yeah, which category uh, uh, do this, you have in mind the, that we're the operating The information under that here? you are requesting pertains to the deliberative process of the executive branch of government, Mr. Chairman. And uh, we are simply protecting our deliberative process in order that we can expect to uh, receive candid advice in the future. Well, does this process have a name? Well, I would suggest at this point it doesn't have a particular name other than to say we're All talking right. about the deliberative process. We, we have not received any demand in terms of a subpoena or something else for, from the committee for this information. If such a demand were forthcoming, then we could call it executive privilege if it were to be raised to that level. It has not been raised to that level. Well, at this point, then I want to recess this hearing. And the hearing stands in recess. Thank you very much. Thank you. Subcommittee will come to order. I'd like to ask everyone to please take their seats. Ask the witness to rejoin us at the witness table. This may be something of a benchmark of uh, congressional hearings in which uh, in a matter concerning 
uh, secrecy agreements, we're advised that we cannot find out who it was that determined that these agreements uh, would be uh, continued to be classified uh, as secret. Uh, this is the, the one impediment I had no reason to expect would happen, Mr. Garfinkel. And so I want to ask you, uh, do you have uh, letters and memorandum concerning this subject matter that brings us here today? I have received a, a letter opinion from the Department of Justice on the legal issues that bring us here today. Right. Are you prepared to uh, bring them forward at our request? Because I'm going to ask you to produce them. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not prepared to give you the specific legal opinion that I received from the Department of Justice, but at my request I have asked the Department of Justice to prepare for the committee a statement of its rationale, its legal rationale on this issue, and I have adv been advised by the Department of Justice that it is prepared to provide the committee with just such a statement, which will uh, in large measure reiterate the issues that were presented to me. Well, is there someone from the Department of Justice here in, the, in this hearing room <laughs> with whom you're consulting? There's no one here with whom I'm consulting from the All Department right. well, of Justice. Chairman Yield. Of course. Uh, Mr. Garfinkel, is that legal opinion classified? No, sir. Is that a public document? No, sir. It would not be a public document if it were requested under the Freedom of Information Act, unless uh, an appropriate official chose to release it. Would it be a public document if requested by a congressional committee? Under subpoena? Uh, that decision would not be mine to make, sir. I, I don't know the answer to that. That decision would have to be made by officials higher than I. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I might make a comment at this point, it seems relatively fruitless for us to move on. First of all, you ask a very simple question as to who formulated this decision with Mr. Garfinkel, and he chooses not to tell the committee that. We ask for the legal basis for his... Uh, letter in which he tells the agencies to ignore a law of this land, and a most recent one in fact, he can't produce that for whatever reason. And it seems to me that uh, the next step for the committee might be to consider a subpoena requesting that specific information from Mr. Garfinkel. At that point, hopefully the committee can move on. But to sit here and to, uh, uh, to hear Mr. Garfinkel tell us that I can't produce it. No, it's not classified. Uh, it would probably be in violation of uh, no authority cited. I think uh, we're going to spin our wheels probably all day on this. And my uh, strong suggestion would be to have the staff enumerate all the information that we are going to be in need of and specifically subpoena that information. Well, I thank you, Mr. Kletzka. Let me ask you, sir, do you have any letters, opinions, documents, pertaining to this subject matter on federal employee secrecy agreements as uh, enacted in Section 618 that you're willing to voluntarily uh, put before the staff of this subcommittee? Well, I, I have copies of legal opinions issued by the courts. Uh, obviously, those are available to you or to anyone else. I, I already have I, I, them. I, I, the I'm courts sure haven't denied yeah. me access to those. It, the only legal opinion that I have, Mr. Chairman, that is responsive to, to your request with respect to the standard form 312 is the one letter opinion that I referenced in my prior answer. And Which one is that? That is a letter opinion that I received from the Department of Justice. Who wrote it? November. It, it was signed by an appropriate official at the Department of Justice in the what was his name? Office of Legal Counsel. Well, was it the head of the Office of Legal Counsel? Uh, uh, yes, sir, it was. Got him. 
Do you have any other opinions or ad, uh, letters of advice and about this subject matter that would uh, assist the committee in understanding how this administration position was arrived at? Well, again, I have asked the Department of Justice, and they have agreed that they will provide the committee. I had hoped to have it this morning. I, uh, given the short time frames that have been involved here, I did not receive it before I arrived here this morning. Uh, but they have agreed that they are preparing a letter for you that explains the rationale behind this decision. Now, you were asked to bring to this hearing copies of any legal opinions or memorandum that you may have received concerning the constitutionality of Section 618 and the duty of the executive branch of government to implement it. Have you brought any such memoranda with you? No, sir, I have not. And is there any particular reason for you not complying with that request? Yes, sir, I, I think it is fair to say that the legal opinion that I sought and received, uh, again, is uh, very much the essence of our ability to deliberate within the executive branch. Now, I want to reiterate something I said before, that, that I certainly take very seriously my responsibility to consult with the Congress, this committee, and have done so many times in the past. And so it was not a decision that we took lightly. We had to weigh our responsibility and to the President uh, and the ability that we ha had to receive candid advice against our desire to cooperate with this committee. And the decision was made that while it would be inappropriate at this time to provide the specific document that I received from the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice was willing to agree to provide this committee with the essence of, of the basis for its advice. <clears throat> You're aware that uh, 618 uh, forbade the employment of Form 312? No, sir. As I read uh, Section 618 and as 618's predecessor um, statutes have been read in the courts uh, before now, it's generally susceptible to, to two different constructions. One construction and the construction that you are suggesting is that the statute specifically forbids the implementation of that form generally, that it's a blanket refusal. Uh, the other construction is that the statute states that those five subparagraphs that appear within the language uh, modify the numbers of the forms as well. And it is that particular interpretation that there is not an outright ban on the use of the SF-312 that guided the, the opinion that we received, because uh, it is our view that if, in fact, Section 312 provides for an outright ban, I, I'm sorry, if, if Section 618 provides for an outright ban on the use of the standard form 312, then that section is unconstitutional. Well, if, if you believe it's unconstitutional and the President signed it into law, uh, where does that leave us? Remember, you have studied constitutional law. Uh, first of all, Mr. Chairman, I don't propose to be a constitutional expert, and I, and I don't appear before you as such. I, I'm often reminded of that by my colleagues at the Department of Justice. Well, you've just Justice made a constitutional determination. No, uh, what I have said is that the advice that I received from who? told me that if we have to read 
Section 618 in a manner that would ban the use and enforcement of Standard Form 312, then Section 618 is unconstitutional. But I have also been advised well, but Mr. Chairman, that we don't that, have to... Isn't that for the courts to decide? And isn't the law in effect until it's found by the court to be unconstitutional? For someone in the administration to make that determination is, uh, is I think, uh, not the customary way we do things. Well, we are, we are certainly in willing. Fact, if, in fact, the president thought mm -hmm. 618 was mm -hmm. unconstitutional, he had the right to veto that uh, mm -hmm. legislation. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Kleksko, we look forward, we look forward to litigating this in court and, and allowing, until that litigation and allowing is resolved, the courts the to law decide stands. this issue. And that issue is currently before the court. However, there has been nothing in this litigation in the form of any injunctive relief granted to plaintiffs that would bar us from continuing to implement this form. Now, they have recently, uh, as I understand it, they have recently the applied for such an injunction, and that matter will be decided by the court. Are you an attorney, Mr. Garfunkel? Yes, I am. Well, you're, you're aware that the executive branch does not make the law. I think you are. You're, you're aware at least that it does not decide constitutional questions. I Again, think you are. I, I would not put myself in a position of... You're not sure if the president decides constitutional I, questions. I would think under, uh, that each branch of, of the, uh, each branch of the federal government has some responsibilities under the Constitution, obviously, and that the interpretation of the laws is ultimately the responsibility of the judiciary, and that this matter is before the judiciary right now. Well, as Mr. Kletzka said, that it's before the court, so what is the status of the law passed by the Congress and signed by the President? Now, that's an easy question. Well, our view of the status is that we are able to implement Section 618 in a constitutional manner, mm -hmm. but we could not do so if we were to interpret it to require us to ban the use of the Standard Form 312. Now, the, again, this matter has been, is before the courts. The issue of whether we should be enjoined from our actions is also before the courts now. And uh, we obviously will litigate this issue and comply with the decisions that the court reaches. Well, but until then, what is the status of the law? Mr. Chairman, this particular litigation was before the Supreme Court only this year. And when, it, when the Supreme Court decided on this case and sent it back to the district court, the Supreme Court admonished that we were uh, to attempt to resolve this thing without getting to the very sticky constitutional questions that seem to surround it, that if at all possible, if at all possible, we were to try to resolve this controversy without some kind of constitutional crisis over it. And that is what we are attempting to do. We do not believe that the President's responsibility to protect classified information can be summarily countermanded uh, in a constitutional manner. Well, did the President of the United States say this was unconstitutional? The President questioned the constitutionality of the statute. I could read extensively from the President's signing statement, and you will see he repeatedly references the fact that there are strong constitutional problems with this enactment. That is why he said, do what you can to interpret this statute in a constitutional manner. And that is why I referred this matter for advice to the Department of Justice and am following its advice that there is only one way. There is only one way to, to implement this. So what, what happened? So what is that one way? That one way is to construe the statute so that it does not create an outright ban on the use of the standard form 312. Well, let's take a look at the law and see how, how we can do that.
Now, have, have there been issued any uh, instructions uh, to implement uh, SF-312 to comply with the checklist in Section 618? The instruction was to continue to use the form as it currently exists. It's our belief that through construction, uh, the form will comply with Section 618. Section 618, no funds appropriated in this or any other act for fiscal year 1990 may be used to implement or enforce the agreements in standard forms 312 and 4355 of the government or any other non-disclosure policy form or agreement if such policy form or agreement, one, concerns information other than that specifically marked as classified or unmarked but known by the employee to be classified or unclassified but known by the employee to be in the process of a classification determination. Two, contains the term classifiable. Three, directly or indirectly obstructs by requirement of prior written authorization, limitation of authorized disclosure or otherwise, the right of any individual to petition or communicate with members of Congress in a secure manner as provided by the rules and procedures of the Congress. Four, interferes with the right of the Congress to obtain executive branch information in a secure manner as provided by the rules and procedures of the Congress. Five, imposes any obligation or invokes any remedies inconsistent with statutory law. Now, would you describe for me the part of Section 618 that raises questionable constitutionality or, in your belief, is unconstitutional? Again, I'm not going to say that it is unconstitutional because our responsibility is to attempt to interpret this law in order to have it be constitutional. Now, it may well be that when this issue is litigated, uh, that will be impossible, and the courts will decide that that is impossible and will make a ruling one way or the other on the constitutionality of this law. Um, again, I don't want to uh, pass myself off as an expert on statutory construction. I am not. I can tell you that based in the litigation that we have, we have gone through so far, there have been several questions raised, uh, questions concerning whether it would be constitutional for the Congress to limit the President's authority to prevent negligent disclosures of classified information. Another issue that has been well, Wait a minute. What section is that found in? <laughs> Uh, Where does that question arise? That, in that, arise, that arises in subsection 1, where uh, the word known uh, appears, but there's no reference to reasonably should know. Uh, let me give you an example if that, that would clarify let's this. Let's see. Concerns, uh, let's see, uh, classification 1, concerns information other than that specifically marked as classified or unmarked but known by the employee to be classified. Now the problem is what? Well the issue that has been raised is uh, the obvious one of when information is unmarked, uh, how the question has been raised, how can we hold anyone accountable if something is unmarked? Well the fact of the matter is uh, there are any number of times when an individual knows that information that he's received, either as an oral communication or uh, through a briefing, is, is classified. There are also instances, and it would be very easy to come up with examples, 
where an individual through his or her own negligence uh, fails to know that information is classified and uh, the executive order on national security information very specifically provides that sanctions should be taken against individuals who knowingly or negligently disclose classified information without authority. But we, we had a legislative process that went through that question. And the, uh, the majority of members, both Democratic and Republican, in the House and the Senate, agreed that they would leave it at this description, notwithstanding your hypothetical. Well, let, that it has to be known by the employee to be classified. Let me suggest, Mr. Chairman, that we have taken the position in litigation that if we must interpret, if we must interpret this statute to say that the President cannot sanction individuals who are negligent in the disclosure of classified information, then this statute also is unconstitutional because it is necessary for the President to be able to protect classified information from unauthorized disclosure when it occurs knowingly or negligently. Well, are you telling us that the President signed into law and agreed to enforce a law that he believed was unconstitutional? The President signed into law and required that we undertake to implement this statute, if we could, in a constitutional manner. And that issue, again, was... Well, you can't rewrite the law, though. I mean, it says, known by the employee to be classified. Now, you can't say, and also, he should have known that it was classified. You, we, we already went through the, the legislative process. Mr. Chairman, again, that issue may ultimately be re resolved, as you're suggesting. It may be resolved that we can't, we can't uh, arrive at a reading of this that we believe uh, ensures the President's ability to protect classified information. And uh, if that's the case, then the courts will decide whether this particular statute is constitutional. We are attempting, as we have been admonished by the Supreme Court, as we understand uh, from general principles of law that we should, uh, we should make every effort to read each statute as if it were constitutional. Well, we, you know, we, we, we taught uh, former Attorney General Meese some constitutional law on this very same question. You remember that, don't you? S Lear, Siegler, and Lehman? I was not involved in that, sir. No, I know you weren't, but you know about the case. No, sir, I'm not familiar with the case. You're not familiar with the no, case. Sir. The case is right on point. Um, well, look, I, I went through this with uh, General Meese. I don't know why I shouldn't go through it with you. Well, again, I, I'm not the Attorney General, and I am not here pr uh, purporting to be a constitutional expert. Uh, I. Oh. I, you know, well, I, I agree with answer. you that you are not a constitutional expert. But still, you're making constitutional distinctions whether you are or not. Mr. Chairman, I am the policy official responsible for implementing this program. And I implement this program based on advice that I receive from experts in any number of areas, including constitutional experts. Well, have you ever heard of the Ninth Circuit's decision in, uh, entitled Lear Siegler versus Lehman? Yes, I've heard the citation. Of course the you have. You, 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 you must have. You cannot, well, I can't tell you what you can tell me. You've told me a lot of things today. Uh, you, you must, you've heard of the case. You must be generally familiar with it because it's on the same question of whether a law the Attorney General thinks is unconstitutional must be enforced until the court decides. 
That's Mr. the same question we're dealing with here. Mr. Chairman, I, I would reiterate you that, had to have seen that, that we are we are attempting to interpret Section 618 as if it were constitutional. We are we are not presupposing that this law is unconstitutional. But Mr. Chairman, if you uh, would yield, the problem with that is, in your opinion, or these unnamed legal experts you've been dealing with, your way to implement the law is to ignore it. And it's very clear. The law indicates no funds appropriated under this act may be used to implement or enforce agreements under Standard Form 312. Your letter, your interpretation indicates the purpose of this letter is to advise you to continue to implement direct opposite of what Section 618 states. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what was the conclusion of that court decision? Wasn't it that the law stands until declared? Well, as everybody who has ever come near a constitutional <laughs> law course knows, most citizens know this, is that a law signed by the President of the United States enacted by the House and Senate is the law of the land until it's declared okay. unconstitutional. Now that you must know, Mr. Garfinkel. Give me some cause to go out here in the holiday with, with a confidence in the executive branch of government. You do understand that, don't you? I believe I understood what you to say to be correct. I, I, again, I, I haven't seen the transcript of what uh, you precisely I'm said. I'm greatly but. relieved. Well, that's okay. Look, uh, let's close down this hearing uh, today with just uh, reminding you what uh, General Meese and, and not just myself but a, a former chairman of this committee Jack Brooks, the former chairman of Judiciary Peter Rodino, Congressman Don Edwards uh, and a host of others on Judiciary Committee went through. Uh, General Meese had a a really, in, a really in interesting interpretation of constitutional law <laughs> He said he didn't accept any decisions of the federal court until it had been received and uh, been decided in the Supreme Court. And if he thought it was unconstitutional, then it was unconstitutional until then. I take it that in this administration that uh, a, a court short of the Supreme Court could declare something unconstitutional and it would be operative. Is that a fair assumption? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I cannot speak for this administration on its constitutional interpretations of, uh, at that level. Uh, again, I'm not the correct person. That would have to be someone from okay. the Department of Justice. All right. Now, on this, uh, in the, the uh, layman case, uh, in which we upheld the constitutionality of the contracting, uh, Competition and Contracting Act, which incidentally came out of this committee. Uh, here's what the Ninth Circuit said. Here the government reasserts the position taken by the Justice Department before Congress, that the President's suspension of the act is justified because the President's duty to uphold the Constitution and faithfully execute the laws empowers the president to interpret the Constitution and disregard laws he deems unconstitutional. Because we regard this position as utterly at odds with the texture and the plain language of the Constitution, and with nearly two centuries of judicial precedent, we must reject the government's contention. End of quotation. I, I would refer this opinion to you uh, and to the Department of Justice and other legal authorities in the executive branch uh, as we continue uh, this discussion. Uh, Mr. Kleska, do you have any closing uh, comments? Well, one, one comment, Mr. Chairman, it would, it would be a request of the staff to, uh, to make a copy of this decision and share it with Mr. Garfinkel so when we reconvene the hearing after the holidays, he would be aware of... Uh, of this actual decision, if he promises to read it only, though. Would you read it if we send it to you? I will be, I will be happy to read it. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll send that copy. Complex you? Guy. I cannot suggest that I will come back a constitutional scholar. Oh, you don't have to agree with it. Just read it. I, I agree to read it. Thank you very much, Mr. Garfinkel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Stands
That concludes this hearing held to look at federal employee secrecy agreements. A program note for our viewers that this Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 Pacific, our guest on our series book notes will be Richard Rhodes, author of a book titled Farm. Mr. Rhodes spent a year on a farm and details his experiences in the book. Stay with us now for an emergency meeting held yesterday evening by the Permanent Council of the Organization of American States to form a reaction to U.S. military action in Panama. Good morning from Washington. You're watching C-SPAN. We'd like to take a short break to bring you an update of our program schedule.